Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Everybody can hear me OK? Yep. All right, excellent. Thank you, Michelle. And I thank you, Satch, for making this all come together. It's been a long journey, but we finally made it. Excellent. Um, thank you all for sh coming this afternoon. Um, as she mentioned, I'm a, I'm a photographer, cinematographer, uh, who I currently specialize in uh, animal conservation, wildlife conservation. Uh, I've been doing animal films for a long time, uh, but only in the last three or four years have I been focused solely on conservation. Uh, today, I'd like to give you a, a presentation I call The Struggle of Beauty. It's a series of about 40 photographs that I've spent the last, say, three or four years uh, shooting mostly in Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. There's a couple other outliers, but mostly those three countries. Uh, and I've focused on these countries because of an organization that I work with in San Francisco called WildAid. Uh, what we do uh, is we work to reduce the illegal demand for uh, trafficked wildlife parts. So elephant ivory, rhino horn, shark fin soup, pangolins, uh, you name it, sea turtles, tigers, all kinds of animals that are bought and sold for mostly bones or skin or things like that. Uh, in my work in Africa with WildAid, we do local campaigns uh, in these countries, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, and now we're starting Zimbabwe and Mozambique and Gabon, where I'll be next week. Um, and we encourage people there in Africa on the supply side, sadly, to uh, take a broader interest in their wildlife and in their natural resources that they have right there in front of them. Surprisingly, a lot of people in Africa who live next to, for instance, Amboseli National Park, this photo here, um, have never seen an elephant in real life, or a lion, or a rhino. And so we encourage these people. We have a, a campaign in Africa called Poaching Steals from Us All. And what we try to do is encourage people to recognize the wealth of their own backyard. Uh, the other part of our work is in Asia, where the demand side mostly is. And there we carry out large media campaigns focused on changing cultural attitudes, uh, raising awareness, those kind of things, that buying these products is really not such a great idea. So with that, we'll get started. Uh, just to begin with, this is a, a, a lovely herd of elephants in Amboseli National Park. You can see Mount Kilimanjaro sort of shrouded in the background there. Uh, has anybody been to Kenya and, and, and seen a good view of Mount Kilimanjaro? It's a, it's a rare day when you get to see a, a nice view of Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, <clears throat> this is an elephant in Serengeti. Uh, who's been to Africa? Wow, that's great. That's awesome. And what? just shout out what countries? Kenya. South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania. That's awesome. Rwanda, wow, excellent. And most of those have been vacations, safari vacations, things like that. Has anybody gone for like other kinds of work or anything? Excellent. Well, part of the point of this exhibition or this presentation is to peel back the curtain a little bit on what most of us normally see when we go to Africa. Normally, when we book a trip to Africa, say South Africa or Kenya or Tanzania, uh, we go, we get off the plane, we're met at the airport, we have a, a wonderful safari driver, we stay in beautiful lodges, we eat great food, get up in the morning, take pictures of beautiful animals all day, come home, have a drink, look at our photos, FaceTime our friends, and start all over the next day. And that's a wonderful experience. And it can really um, give you, give you a, a vision of the world that's really hard to get anywhere else. And Africa has that sort of majesty and that sort of magic to suck you in when you're on safari. That first elephant you see in the morning, that first lion that you see is just like, whoa, there's a lion six feet away. I mean, that's an amazing thing. But sadly, unfortunately, there's a lot of issues in Africa that we don't see when we're on safari. Um, there's a lot of problems that are just sort of over the hill or around the corner or maybe tucked away in a little metal shed somewhere that we drive by on the way to our lodge. And part of the point of this presentation is to peel that curtain back a little bit and talk about some of those issues that are a daily occurrence in Africa. Um, and a lot of those issues, uh, there are a ton of NGOs trying to help solve. But uh, the reason I'm excited to be here at Google today is that there's so many great minds at Google that I think, you know, 
a little bit of thought here, I think we could come up with a lot of other uh, innovative solutions on some of these problems. Some of them are super easy you know, problems. They, they look super easy. Um, how to keep elephants away from crops, for instance. How to keep lions away from livestock. There's all sorts of people trying all sorts of things. Other problems are more sort of endemic and economic and larger scale problems. But at any rate, that's why I'm here today is sort of to, to give you a little taste of all of that stuff. Um, obviously, one of the biggest problems in Africa today is elephant ivory. Uh, elephant ivory is still a widely traded product. Uh, an elephant is killed on the continent of Africa roughly every 15 minutes, and those are always killed for ivory. And the sad thing is, it doesn't matter how big or old or young the elephant is, if there's any ivory at all, it will be taken. Uh, the good news is, uh, uh, in partnership, uh, Wild Aid has sort of led the fight on this. China has, uh, in the last year, banned the sale of ivory. Hong Kong has banned the sale of ivory. Taiwan recently banned the sale of ivory. Singapore is about to ban the sale of ivory. So there is progress being made. The price of ivory is dropping per kilo, but it's still an expensive product that people buy. Uh, Japan, if you didn't know, Japan is the last legal market for ivory left on the planet. And we're working hard to shut that one down. <clears throat> An animal a lot of people love, zebras. I'm sure you all saw zebras when you were in Africa. I hope you did anyway. They're everywhere. Um, zebras are doing well in Africa, but there are three subspecies of zebra that number uh, less, well, two of them number less than 800, and one numbers less than 4,000. The main zebra is about uh, 200,000 left on the continent. They're wonderful animals, but the problem with zebras uh, is they're running into a lack of habitat uh, as uh, ranching uh, expands. Zebras are now cohabitating with cows and sheep and all sorts of things. And so when you drive through Africa, you'll see a lot of zebras uh, outside the conservancy areas uh, hanging out with cows and all kinds of stuff. But zebras are, are, are a lot. Who loves zebras? Everybody loves zebras, right? How many stripes does a zebra have? One. Think about it just for a minute. <laughs> rhinos, unfortunately rhinos is another big problem in Africa. Rhino poaching uh, for the horn. The horn is worth more by weight than diamonds, gold, and cocaine. Currently the price of rhino horn is somewhere around $15,000 to $20,000 a kilo. At its height it was $60,000 a kilo. So the good news is the price of rhino horn is falling. But the bad news is about three rhinos a day across the African continent are poached for rhino horn. Three a day. There's only about 25,000 rhinos left in the wild. So you do the math. In the last few years, something like 6,000 rhinos have been poached. So if the current trend is not reversed, rhinos could be extinct in the wild in about 20 years, which is a sad thing. Uh, the rhino poaching peaked in the 70s and then went down in the 80s and early 90s. And then beginning in the 2000s, a new market opened in Vietnam for rhino horn. And they were claiming that it cured cancer, that it uh, was an aphrodisiac, that it did all these wonderful magical things. Uh, rhino horn, for your information, is made of the same thing as your fingernail, keratin. So if you really want rhino horn, just buy it on your fingernail or your toenail. There's more of it there. Um, so. What we try to do is we try to uh, discourage sales of, of rhino horn in Asia, which is a difficult thing to do. Uh, there's a lot of solutions people have proposed. Uh, some conservancies uh, shave off the horn. Some conservancies poison the horn. But this involves a very expensive process of tranquilizing the animal with a vet, bringing it in. Uh, and even, even with a horn cut off a rhino, Poachers will still kill the rhino for the stump of horn. It's worth that much money. This rhino is named Na Jin. She is one of two remaining northern white rhinos left on the planet. She and her uh, pen mate out of the photo are the only two of this species left on the planet. The male died earlier this year. You may have read about it. His name was Sudan. I have a picture of him coming up. She is, uh, she's too old to breed, and so is her friend. They are kept under lock and key, 24 hour a day armed guard. Most conservancies in Africa that have rhino populations uh, in northern Africa, 
just as an aside, my work, today I'm going to talk about sort of Central Eastern Africa. I'm not going to really mention South Africa or Botswana or any of those other places. The experience here is in Central Africa, but these problems are all across the continent. Uh, the, the problem with having rhinos on your conservancy, it's very expensive. You have to have 24 hour a day armed guards. So uh, rhino conservation is a, is a pricey thing, but it's important. You guys all saw rhinos when you were in Africa? Pretty amazing animals. Gorillas, who's been gorilla trekking? Yay, one person. Gorilla trekking, if there's one thing you do in Africa, if you go back to Africa and there's one thing you do, this. Go see a gorilla. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of money, takes some time, takes some effort, but it is the most magical thing you will ever do in your life, and I guarantee it. Um, this guy was about six feet away when I took this photo. This was in uh, Uganda, in the Buwindi Impenetrable Forest, which isn't so impenetrable because I got there. Um, there are about 950 mountain gorillas, highland mountain gorillas left in the world in, in the sort of corner of Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda in that little area. They're squeezed in there in uh, three different national parks. Uh, uh, and gorillas face a, a lot of um, challenges, habitat loss, deforestation. They're occasionally killed for bushmeat and occasionally killed just for sport, which thank God not a lot, of hap not a lot happens, but occasionally they are. Um, these are not the kind of gorillas you'll see in a zoo. The gorillas in a zoo are lowland gorillas. Mountain highland gorillas don't do well in captivity. That's why you'll never see them in a zoo. Um, but when you see them in the wild, um, this guy was, like I said, he's a young, I think a male, young male. Uh, he was about six feet away. Um, when you trek with gorillas, they allow you to have an hour with the gorilla. So basically, I was just sitting on the forest floor. Um, and right before I shot this photo, the large silverback, the large male of the group, who's maybe 400 pounds, he was off five or six feet away from me. And he got up, and I was lying down with my camera. He got up, and he started walking towards me. And I was a little intimidated with this very large animal coming. So I stood up, and I was about to move. And the, the guide behind me, the Ugandan guide behind me, just kept whispering in my ear. He was like, don't move. Don't move. And the silverback went right in front of me. I could have reached down and pet him. But the whole time that was happening, my guide just kept saying over and over and over, don't move. <laughs> so when you see a gorilla, it's an amazing experience. I, I strongly encourage you if, you, if you ever go back to Africa, to do it. Uh, from a tourism point of view, gorillas, for instance, are the largest grossing tourism activity in Uganda. So um, the money that they make from, from gorillas actually goes back into the economy in a, in a good way. It's not, not the, the, the corruption isn't so bad there. So uh, the money you spend, you have to get a gorilla permit and all of that. But it's, it's a lot of money, but it's worth it. Giraffes, another favorite. Who loves giraffes? Yeah, who doesn't? Uh, everybody sort of takes giraffes for granted when they go to Africa, but giraffe populations in Central and Eastern Africa have declined 40% in the last 30 years. Not very many people sort of take that into consideration. Um, this is a reticulated giraffe uh, at, a, at a private conservancy, Old Yogi, in, uh, in uh, um, Kenya. Um, Giraffe populations are in trouble in Africa. Why? They're poached for their skins, occasionally meat. Their tails are used for fly swatters, um, and uh, mostly for their skins and meat. Unfortunately, also, uh, they're running out of habitat, food, uh, all sorts of problems. Uh, if you ever get a chance to do a walking safari with a, with a herd of giraffes, I highly recommend it. Uh, when they run, it looks like they're in slow motion. It's, the, it's one of my favorite things to watch ever. But a lot of people don't realize that giraffes are in big trouble. All across the continent, they're in big trouble. Elephants, again, this is a herd of elephants in Amboseli National Park in Kenya. Um, elephants are a huge driver in the economy in Africa. It's, it's estimated that one elephant can bring in over $1 million of tourism revenue in its life uh, versus a few thousand dollars for the poacher who gets the tusk. Poaching is an interesting thing. They will, they will take the mothers of uh, elephant herds or matriarchal societies, so they're run by the ladies. Uh, when the guys get to be teenagers, they're booted out, 
and the ladies stick together the rest of their life. Poachers will, will take any tusk and leave the little guys uh, as orphans. There's a great uh, orphanage uh, in Nairobi, the William or the uh, Daphne Sheldrick Orphanage. Has anybody been there? Yeah, it's great. Last year they had some awesome news. It's the first year in their existence they haven't taken in a new orphan. So that means poaching is down, which is great news. The way poaching works, as I understand it, there's usually one guy in a village who owns the gun and the bullets. And if you want to poach an elephant or a rhino, you go rent the gun, buy a few bullets, and off you go. Uh, mostly you get your friends with you, and when you sneak into the conservancy, you take the gun apart and each person has a different part of the gun. You ride your motorbike in, you put the gun together, you find your animal, shoot it, gun disappears, boom, out you go. That's normally how it's done. You actually buy the bullets and they're not very good shots. And that's why, unfortunately, in a lot of cases when an animal is poached, it's a long, horrible process because the people aren't very good at what they're doing. Uh, some of them are. Anyway, you can see uh, in some places you go in Africa, elephants are very wary of people. They'll, they'll sort of shy back from you when you get close. In other places in Africa, where, for instance, in Uganda, where there's not so many tourists and not so the poaching isn't too bad, the elephants are much more aggressive towards you, and they'll come right up to the car and uh, sometimes even chase you, which can be exciting. Any part of conservation in Africa must include the local people. You can't get anywhere without the local people on your side. You have to give them a reason to be invested in the conservation program. You have to give them a reason to care. You have to give them a reason to be involved. You can't just come in and say, this is what we're doing. Here, we're going to do this, 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 and this, and this, and you're going to be happy about it. You have to be really on board with the local people for any long-term conservation plan. Unfortunately, Africa wildlife conservation in Africa is not just like a 10-year deal or a 20-year deal. It's forever. It's a forever deal. If the animals are going to survive past our lifetimes and your children's lifetimes, it's 24 hours, 24-7 conservation for the foreseeable future. And the only way that's sustainable is by getting local people on your side. These two lovely ladies are Samburu, uh, in this, right outside the Samburu National Park in Kenya. And they work with an organization called Iwasu Lions. It's a small organization in Kenya run by a fabulous woman, Shivani. And what she does is um, she finds women in the village who maybe are a little older, maybe they're divorced, maybe they've lost their husbands, their children are away. They really don't, maybe, maybe have too much to do or not involved that much in the village. She'll take them out, she'll teach them how to drive, she'll teach them how to use a radio, she'll teach them how to use a GPS, and they become lion guardians. So they drive around and they look for lions. And when they find a lion, they report that to the village so that they can move the livestock out of the way of the lion. And it gives them purpose. It gives them purpose to protect the animals. It gives them purpose in their village. It gives them responsibility. It gives them skills that maybe other villagers don't have. So these small programs, uh, Wild Aid partners with several small NGOs, Iwasu Lions being one of them. And they really are, it's a very sort of micro convers cons conservation efforts, just like, just in one little area. So not all conservation is like WWF or something like that worldwide. A lot of conservation is just very small little bits here and there getting the job done. But these ladies were great. Uh, I spent uh, all afternoon with them and, and bought some of their jewelry and very interesting people. Chimps, another of the great apes. Uh, most people think chimps are doing okay. You really don't hear much about chimps. The chimps are under a lot of pressure in Africa. This particular chimp is part of a, a group of chimps called the Belindi chimps in a region of Uganda called Hoima. Uh, this chimp is, uh, there's five families of chimps in this area of Uganda. Uganda has about 5,000 chimps left. Uh, but this chimp is part of a family of about 20 to 25. And they have been, because of habitat destruction, they've been reduced to about two acres of forested land. Two acres. So it's about maybe the parking lot out here. That's it, that's all they have. And the parking, and, the, and the, uh, the area runs, it's not just one nice block of forest. It goes sort of down a stream between everybody's yards. So these chimps are now stranded in an island of, of humanity. And the only way they can eat is to raid farmers' crops, 
is to interact with people, is to cross busy highways, is, is they're basically, it's a wild family of chimps stranded in a sea of humanity. There are five such families across Uganda. What is the cause? Well, in traditional African families, the family gets a plot of land, and then as they have children, they divide that plot of land up for their children, and so the plots get smaller and smaller and smaller, and then as the children go to school, they have to sell, the, they cut the wood down to pay for school fees, to pay for the books, the uniforms, blah, blah, blah. And unfortunately, what that does is it, it creates a less and less habitat for the chimps. The chimps get more and more desperate. The chimps interact more and more with people, and problems arise. There's a great a little foundation called the Belindi Chimps, B-U-L-I-N-D-I. Uh, and it's a one guy and his girlfriend, and he's trying to save these chimps. Uh, he's a great guy. If you're looking for a place to, to donate five bucks or 10 bucks for Christmas, he's great, and it'll help these, these chimps. Uh, this chimp, uh, when I was photographing her, she was picking sticks off the tree and throwing them at me, uh, trying to nail me with the sticks. It was pretty good. I have one of the sticks at home in my apartment. She was good, she, her, she had a good arm. Uh, but anyway, it was a really sad day uh, to film some of these. I, you have to have, unfortunately, sometimes you have to have a, a good sense of humor in my work, because you can see a lot of not so great stories. The great wildebeest migration, has anybody seen that in Africa? Yes, it's pretty amazing, huh? It's unbelievable. So this was last February in, in Dutu, which is next to Serengeti in Tanzania. For those of you who don't know, the, the wildebeest migration is the largest remaining overland sort of migration of animals left. Uh, there's a large one in, in uh, Alaska, the porcupine herd of, of caribou, but this is a little bit bigger. Uh, it's about two million animals, and they make this circular trek of 500 miles in search of food and water. Uh, there's zebras, there's wildebeest, there's antelope, there's all kinds of animals. And when you watch them, you can't really tell who's making the decisions, but somebody is. I mean, there's be a little line going that way, another line going that way, another line going that way. The reason I show this picture is because it's uncertain uh, where this migration will end up in 30 or 40 years because of climate change. Right now, most of the area of the migration is in protected uh, zones in, in Kenya and Tanzania. They sort of do a big circle between Kenya and Tanzania. But the question is, where, where will, it, will it shift because of climate change? Will that habitable zone sort of shift around? And if it does, what will happen to these animals? Will they start migrating through Nairobi? That, that would be quite a scene. So um, that's another issue that we work with uh, at WildAid. We do climate change programs, for instance, in Asia to get people to ride more bikes, to eat less meat, things like that. Um, so uh, it's, it's really a holistic thing when you look at conservation. You have to look at these big problems of climate change, these little problems of the villagers, every, everything. Lions. Who doesn't love lions? I love lions. Unfortunately, lions are not doing well in Africa. There are only about 20,000 lions left on, on the continent. Uh, and they're being killed mostly from human wildlife conflict. Uh, they will attack a farmer's livestock or something like that and the farmer will retaliate and kill the lion. This lion I shot at uh, uh, sunrise in Tanzania. It was Serengeti in Tanzania, and she was looking at me for a while and then got up and left. Lions are incredible creatures, uh, and, and they need our help. Lions could be extinct in the wild in 10 years or 20 years. So it's, it's, it's a dire situation for a, li a lot of lions, and the, another part of the problem as with tigers in India, uh, these animals are relegated to small conservation islands, sort of, conservancies here and there all over the place. And it's very difficult for them to get from one to the other. So the DNA pools are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So there has to be uh, a good way to try to <coughs> intermix these lions. And it's, it's becoming more and more challenging as, as more development comes across Africa. And in, by the way, the tigers in India, which are doing really well, have the same problem tr going from one tiger reserve to the other in India. Local people, again, local people are incredibly important when you think about any conservation plan. These are some Maasai herders uh, in the Ngorogoro uh, conservation area just on the other side of Ngorogoro Crater in Tanzania. It's sort of the, this is sort of the back side of the crater, 
and this sort of slopes down to the Serengeti. This is called a boma. It's their village uh, where they live. Um, and these are young cattle. The older cattle were off in the, off in the, in the hills. Uh, but this uh, is another organization we work with called Cop Lions, which is right in the Ngorogoro Conservation Area. And they work with Maasai tribes uh, to, in some Maasai culture, for, if make sure I get this right, uh, a young man to, be, to go from a, a, a child to a man he kills a lion. Is that correct? And so the Cop Lions works with the young men and they train them not to kill the lions, but to protect the lions, just like the women in the previous photo. So they go out and they guard the lions. And they take pride from not killing a lion, but from saving a lion. And this is very important. Again, it's a very small organization called Cop Lions, and they only work in the Ngorogoro crater area. Um, but it's working. It's having a positive effect. Another problem with uh, livestock growth is that the villagers will push their livestock after they've overgrazed a certain area outside the conservation zone, the, the livestock will get slowly pushed inside the conservation zone where the vegetation is better, where there's better food. What that does is it pushes the livestock closer and closer and closer to the lions, and then you end up having inevitable problems with lions attacking sheep and cattle, and then the villagers retaliating. So it's a, that's an issue where there's a lot of smart minds around the world trying to figure out high-tech enclosures for, wild, or for uh, sheep and cattle, for instance, how to keep uh, livestock safe in the middle of nowhere from lions. Uh, we work with organizations that use uh, advanced solar-powered sort of motion detector lighting. We do, we've worked with some villagers in Uganda who've cooked up this, like for instance, elephants raiding crops. They've cooked up this uh, elephant repellent, which is elephant dung and chili pepper and ginger and rotten eggs all mixed up and then fermented for like a week. And then they run around and they spray it all over their crops. It is the most foul thing you've ever seen. But the elephants hate it. So the elephants stay away. Who, I mean, how you came up with that recipe, I don't know. I had to film it one day and it was like, not easy. <laughs> not easy. Anyway. Those are situations where uh, you know simple ideas like this uh, can go a long way. So you know if you're bored at home thinking, how would I keep a lion away from a sheep, or how would I keep an elephant out of the crops, you know just just any idea. There's organizations all across Africa trying basically anything that works to to try to mitigate this problem. Yes, it's a lovely photo of zebras, but that's not why I'm showing it to you. And it's a lovely Egyptian duck here for you birders out there. This was shot in a private conservancy, Old Yogi, in Kenya. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's Tom Hanks' favorite uh, vacation place. It's a very expensive place to go. If you rent the whole place, you're guaranteed to have 6,000 acres on your own. Um, but anyway, they let us come and shoot one day. And I was lucky enough to have these zebras line up like this. The reason I'm showing you this picture is because of water. Water is a huge issue everywhere, here. Uh, water's a big problem, but in Africa, it's a large problem as well. Um, there's wells being drilled all It's kind of like the Central Valley here. They're, they're depleting the water much faster than it is replenished. And that's another thing that uh, great minds could focus on, is how we keep water coming um, fresh and on a daily basis for all these people that need it. <coughs> a lot of animals have to travel long distances to find water, and then they end up competing with the livestock and all that sort of stuff. So it's an issue. Another big problem in Africa uh, is deforestation. The continent of Africa is being deforested at about twice the rate of the rest of the planet. Why? This, charcoal. If you drive around rural Africa, uh, at least the parts of Africa that I've been to, you'll, you'll pass hundreds of these bags of charcoal on the side of the road, uh, and people buy them, like for instance truckers, when they've gone out into the, into the countryside, deliver their load on the way back into the city, they'll buy a bunch of charcoal and fill up their truck and truck that into the city. This is in the port of Zanzibar in Tanzania. Uh, these guys are unloading 
uh, sacks of charcoal from traditional Dow sailing ships in, in the port of Zanzibar, which has changed very little in about 900 years. So this is what it would have looked like even 500 years ago. Somebody told me that just alone on the island of Zanzibar, 20,000 sacks of charcoal a day are used. Now, why people won't use natural gas or propane? There's a lot of NGOs that have tried to introduce those kind of stoves. It's because it's a very sort of ingrained cultural practice. For instance, in Uganda, the local people believe that in order for your beans to taste right, you have to slow cook them for four hours over charcoal. You can't hot cook them over 20 minutes in, in, in a propane pressure cooker. So it's a very difficult process. It's very, oh, thank you, changing these, changing these cultural beliefs. But unfortunately, Africa, like I said, is being deforested at a huge rate. Um, and sooner or later, uh, like everything else, we're going to run out of wood. If you drive around Africa, you see it. It's all over the place. For instance, if you go trek with the uh, chimpanzee or the gorillas in, in uh, the windy impenetrable forest, as you walk to the edge of the forest, it's nothing but deforested hillsides. And then all of a sudden, where the national park starts, it's a sheer wall of forest canopy. Bushmeat is another major problem in Africa. Uh, Bushmeat is any animal uh, that is consumed for either uh, food or economic gain. Uh, mostly they are animals like this. This is a hartebeest in Murchison Falls National Park in Uganda. Mostly they're antelopes that are hunted for meat. For instance, on the way to the park on the day that I shot, or the day before, there was a guy walking down the, the road with a, the hind quarter of one of these animals over his leg, over his shoulder. It's illegal to hunt these animals, but they're a huge source of protein for people and money. They're sold for re to restaurants uh, locally and exported abroad. Unfortunately, the only way to get a lot of bushmeat is to go into the conservation area, the national parks, set traps, harvest the bushmeat. But the, as you'll see soon, those traps do devastating damage to other animals. Gorillas again. Um, this was a gorilla I shot the first time I trekked with gorillas. I've done it twice. This gorilla and I were both enjoying a torrential rainstorm. As you can see, she's very happy. The great thing about gorillas is if you spend enough time with them, there are actually a lot of animals in Africa. And this is something I encourage you to do if you go back to Africa. Spend time with these animals. A lot of time. A lot of safaris, they pull up, they see a lion, they're like, oh, look, lion, and off you go. You don't really learn anything about a lion. You get a picture selfie, but that's about it. I strongly encourage you, if you go back to Africa or if you haven't been to Africa, when you go on safari, ask your driver when you find an animal that you're really into or really like, just sit and wait. Other jeeps will come and leave and come and leave and come and leave, but then sooner or later you'll find yourself alone with that animal. And you will see unbelievable things. If you just sit still, you will see animals are so much like us and there's so many things that they do which are entertaining far more than your house cat or your dog. Believe me, a 400-pound gorilla is way more entertaining than your cat. So um, I just encourage you as a, as, a, as a person, if you're a photographer or, or you're into nature, just sit with the animal. Just sit. Tourism. Like I said earlier, uh, gor gorillas are the biggest source of tourism income in Uganda. Tourism is a double-edged sword. It brings in badly needed, badly needed economic revenue. But on the other hand, the, um, the effects it has on the national parks and the animals is not really settled. For instance, this photograph I shot in a place uh, uh, in a national park called Lake Mburu in, in Uganda. It's a beautiful little national park. Normally, when I travel in Africa, I have an armed national park ranger with me uh, almost all the time. Uh, these people had rented their own car, which you can do, and they had driven it off-road. As you can see, she's very excited about getting her iPhone photo of something. Uh, and the problem is when they drive off-road, a lot of times tourists don't respect the, the wildlife. They get way too close. They speed down the road. They, they kill animals on the road. So if you go to Africa and if you choose this mode of safari, do it responsibly. Or if you go to Africa and do any safari, do it responsibly. 
Make sure that they're not, if you get an off-road permit, whether you can get them, they're difficult to get, but you can get an off-road permit, which allows you to drive anywhere. Um, but don't beat be, don't be these guys. Do it right, respect the, the area that you're in. You wouldn't want people over here driving through your front yard to look at your dog. Again, tourism is a double-edged sword. Sometimes when you go to Africa, you'll be blessed to have the experience all to yourself, but most, more than likely, this is what you'll see. This is in Ngorogoro National Park in Tanzania, one of the most amazing, it's kind of the Disneyland of, of, uh, of Africa. Tanzania has, I think if I'm right, the, the densest uh, population of animals anywhere in Africa. So if you go on safari, Tanzania is a good place to go. Unfortunately, in the Ngorogoro uh, crater area itself, on any, it's not that large, it's large but not huge. On any given day, there can be about 300 Jeeps in the crater. So just trying to get a perfect shot of an animal can be very difficult. And a lot of times you'll find a lion or something like this, and the Jeeps will just follow the lion. There are rules about how long you're supposed to spend with an animal and all that sort of stuff, but a lot of times they're not followed. So again, nobody's really sort of um, done any studies that I'm aware of of the effect on animals, except that sometimes, uh, for instance, when you follow a kill, if you're, if you're tracking a cheetah or a lion in Africa trying to photograph the kill and you interrupt that kill by, by putting your car in the wrong place, the animal will stop the kill and, and move on and perhaps uh, miss a badly needed meal. Again, here's a sample photo. For those of you who've been on safari, you've probably seen this. This is inside the crater, in Gorogoro Crater, and inside here somewhere is an animal. <laughs> As a filmmaker, I've been doing, like I said, wildlife films for a long time. When I see this, I just tell my driver, let's just keep going. Just, we'll find something else. And the, the, the amazing thing is if you're super into photography and you want to get some amazing shots of animals in Africa, you got to go out really early be, before everyone else and stay late. And the minute you find an animal, get your Jeep in the right place and start taking pictures because you've only got five or 10 minutes before the guy gets on his radio and says, hey, we got a great lion here. So um, unfortunately, like I said, the, the money from tourism is a badly needed resource but nobody's really quite sure of the long-term effects. And tourism is just growing and growing and growing and growing and growing. Another big problem in Africa people aren't aware of too much is vultures. I bet you didn't know vultures, some species of vultures have declined by 90% in three generations in Africa, 90%. Vultures are now a threatened species. Why is that? Who wants to kill a vulture? Nobody wants to kill a vulture. The problem is when a lion kills a sheep, the farmer gets mad at the lion. He knows the lion will come back to eat that sheep, so he poisons the sheep to kill the lion. But who eats the sheep before the lion? The vulture. Vultures are dying at a rate mostly due to poisoning. And this is another side effect of human-wildlife conflict. This is why so much energy is being put into Africa right now to mitigate human wildlife conflict because of species like vultures who are dying uh, as, as innocent bystanders, basically. So you'll think twice now the next time you see a vulture. And uh, the vultures here, if uh, they had just, this is a dead wildebeest in Serengeti in Tanzania. It's amazing to watch them uh, fight over it and fight with each other. I sat and watched these guys for about 45 minutes before my driver got, he was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Nobody watches vultures for 45 minutes. He's like, let's go look at lions. I'm like, no, let's, we're going to stay right here. Leopards, another favorite animal. Did, did everybody see a leopard when they went to Africa? Yeah, good, 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 good. Leopards are hard to see. They're very elusive. They're very shy creatures. Uh, the best way I look for a leopard is they like to sit in trees like this, is look for the tail dangling uh, down there below the, the branch. You'll, if you look far away from it, you'll see a tree. You won't be able to see the leopard, but you'll be able to see the tail. That's the way I try to spot them. There are only about 12,000 leopards left in the wild. They're hunted mainly for their skins, their skulls, their bones, their teeth. Uh, it's unfortunate, but leopards are a prized animal still to this day. Uh, occasionally, they're even trapped and sold uh, to wealthy families in the Middle East as pets, along with cheetahs. Uh, but if, you, if you're lucky enough that this was in uh, Serengeti, in, or 
in Dutu near in Tanzania, about 6.30 at night. That's when you best see a leopard is very early in the morning or very late at night. Um, unfortunately, like I said, leopards are prized uh, for their skins and bones. Another big problem in Africa, which we have here in San Francisco, is development. Where do we put all the people? This is a big problem in Africa as well. Cities are growing rapidly. The population is growing rapidly. The wealth is growing rapidly. People want nice places to live. They want nice cities. This is Nairobi in Kenya. This area in the foreground is Nairobi National Park. It's a small national park just outside of Nairobi where you can go in just for the day and see some animals. Unfortunately, um, if you go to Nairobi National Park and drive around for the day, you'll see that the animals aren't in really great condition. Uh, they're under a lot of pressure from the, from the city. In fact, uh, if you spend a day there, you'll see people driving their car, whew, flying down the road, and there's lions right on the side of the road. So um, it's sort of an endemic, pro it's sort of a, it's a good little microcosm uh, to see what's happening with, with development all over Africa. <clears throat> this is um, sort of a sad moment in our, in, our, in our journey here. This is Sudan. This was the last northern white male rhino left on the planet who died earlier this year. I had the chance to visit him twice over the last three years. He was 45 when he died. A normal rhino lives to be about 30 something, 36, 37 maybe. Uh, if you ever get a chance to pet a rhino, they love to be scratched right behind their ear there and right under their leg here, sort of their underarm. Uh, rhinos are actually very gentle creatures. Um, you have to be careful around them, they weigh a lot. So if a rhino, if you're standing next to a rhino and the rhino moves, you kind of got to move with it. Um, but they're, they're incredibly wonderful creatures. Uh, and even this rhino, at this advanced age, the only one of his kind, the, they sawed his, his horns down to make him less attractive for poachers. Uh, he was in a walled enclosure under 24 hour a day armed guard his entire life because of his horns. Unfortunately, uh, he was not able to breed and the two females that are left are too old to breed. They did take a lot of samples from him and there are some organizations here in the United States and in Germany working to clone rhinos. I don't know, there's no news about that yet, but I know that there are two organizations working to clone this species of rhino. But I think if you look at this photo, you'll see a, a wonderful creature and be reminded that extinction is forever. Once these animals are gone, they're gone. They're not coming back. And that is a big problem in Africa. And I, it's a big problem you could see in your lifetime, your children could see in your lifetime. No more lions, no more rhinos, no more giraffes. Can you imagine taking your child to Africa and not being able to see a lion? I mean, that's Africa, a lion. So think about that for a minute. This is, this is what I was talking earlier about bushmeat trade. These are the snares that are set. This is one ranger facility in one corner of a national park in Uganda. This is the amount of snares they collected in just six months. These are all made out of just uh, thick wire. They're set like a noose in the bush. And as the animal steps into it, it tightens around there. And then one end is attached to a tree. And they can't get out, and so they then the hunters come by and kill the animal. Unfortunately, this snare doesn't care what it catches. So say you're out to catch a heart of beast, which is a large antelope creature, and you want to eat that, well, you might end up with a Cape buffalo. You might end up with a lion. You might end up with an elephant. Another problem in Africa with bushmeat is homemade spring traps. You know, the big kind of old bear, Alaska bear traps. They are placed all over the bush as well and they harm not only the wildlife, but rangers as well on patrol. You have to be very careful of stepping into these large traps. They'll pull your, as you can see here, sever the foot right off of an antelope. And here is a pile of range of uh, snaps, uh, snap traps in the same ranger station. This is about a six month supply of traps in one ranger station, in one corner of one national park. So you can see they're made out of leaf springs for cars, all sorts of things. So the, this is the point of, of showing you these. It's how we get people weaned off of bushmeat. It's economic issues, it's food issues, it's cultural issues, it's all sorts of things. But we need to get people convinced that these animals are worth far more alive than they are dead. That's the trick. 
Here's what happens when an animal gets in a snare. Here's an elephant with a, a normal trunk. Here's an elephant missing his trunk because it got chopped off in a snare. The morning I filmed these guys in, in Uganda, these were, there were four young uh, bull elephants, male elephants, and three of the four had damaged trunks from snares, three of the four. This was the only one who was normal. This is a lion caught in a snare from Uganda. The snare has actually been cut off. Uh, they tranquilized the lion and put on a GPS collar. But this is, the, this is the, the scar left over from the snare. So you can see that these are incredibly damaged, damaging uh, uh, simple things. It's just a wire in the, in the, in the, in the bush. But the, obviously, the people don't want to catch lions. They're not trying to eat lions. They wanted to catch some sort of uh, antelope. Another problem with bush meat, this is a Cape buffalo. So you have uh, guys running around with spears and bow and arrow and any, basically any weapon they can come up with. I'm not, this was in Uganda as well. I'm not sure whether this animal was the target of the attack or whether he charged the hunters and the hunters threw a spear in self-defense. I'm not sure, but at any rate, that spear's not coming out and that animal's gonna live with that spear for the rest of its life. So these are the, these are the sort of problems that you don't see when you're on safari. Or maybe you will see an animal with a spear, but uh, it, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, questions there. Ivory, again, is a major problem. This is a, a habituated, social, sort of socialized uh, bull elephant in uh, Old Yogi Conservancy in uh, Kenya. He's 12 feet tall. <laughs> so when I was taking this photo, I was about this close to that elephant, hoping that he wasn't going to move. Um, elephants, again, are, are an iconic species in Africa, and we, we need to work very hard to curb the ivory trade uh, and make sure that, you know, that, that anything ivory related doesn't belong on you, it belongs on the elephant. This is a good example of how ivory fuels conflict across Africa. Wildlife, the wildlife trade conservatively is estimated to be about $20 billion worldwide, the trade in, in legal uh, parts. For instance, Boko Haram in Nigeria has been well-funded through their trade of ivory of Nigerian elephants. Um, this is in a ranger station in Uganda as well. This markings on the ivory here is dried blood and some AK-47s. Um, so you can see that there's all sorts of sizes of ivory. Uh, and again, they'll take any size or whatever. But ivory, not only, it's like drug running in South America. It fuels violence and it fuels instability in these countries. Again, this is that same bull elephant in, uh, in, in Old Yogi in Kenya. I just love this guy. And it's a great photo of the ivory. You can see how in the natural environment, how ivory gets uh, chucked up quite a bit. Here's an animal. Does anybody know what this is? Pangolin. Pangolin is the most trafficked animal on the planet. The most illegally trafficked animal on the planet. It's in the anteater family. These little guys, when they're afraid, they roll up in a ball like that. It's about like this big. If you were to hold one by the tail and unwrap it, it would be about that long. But their meat is considered a delicacy in many Asian countries, and their scales are dried and ground up and considered a medicinal have, have, have special medicinal properties, none of which have ever been proved. These three pangolins are the only pangolins I've ever seen alive. They're very elusive animals, nocturnal creatures. You can go all day in Africa, and, I mean, for a year and never see a pangolin. Have you seen one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're very hard to see. Very hard. Yeah, they're very hard to see. I've looked and tried and tried and tried and tried. This uh, was in a bushmeat market in Yaoundi, Cameroon, which is the capital city of Cameroon. Here's the lady who was selling them. That's her foot, so you can get an idea of how big they are. She was selling each one of these pangolins for $10 each. I offered to pay her $10 to take the photo. I took this photo with my iPhone because I was there pretending just to be a tourist with my Cameroonian guide. As soon as I gave her the $10, all hell broke loose in the bushmeat market and we left. Um, so I was able to get one photo of these poor pangolins in a very sad state. There were about 20 pangolins in this bushmeat market, uh, all in various uh, stages of consciousness. 
Uh, that is one activity I, I highly discourage you from doing if you're in ever, ever in Africa is to visit a bushmeat market. It might sound fun, but it's not. Anyway, pangolins. Uh, do some research. If you don't know much about pangolins, do some research. Um, the, the BBC just came out with a really funny little pangolin movie about uh, three or four months ago about a woman in Zimbabwe, I think, who runs a pangolin orphanage. It's a really cute movie. Unfortunately, this is the result of the leopard trade. Here you can see the leopard skin and the, in the, the teeth. This is in a, in a ranger station in Uganda. This is the largest stockpile of ivory left in the world in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. It's about 50 metric ton, or 80 metric tons of ivory, worth about $50 million on the open market. This is one shelf inside of uh, two gigantic warehouses. Uh, the, the good news and the bad news. Kenya, uh, about a year ago, Kenya had a similar stockpile and they burnt it. They made a big deal of burning it. Uh, there are a lot of organizations, Wild Aid included, pressuring Tanzania to get rid of this ivory. Uh, one of the suggestions we've given them is to grind it up uh, and create an, a monument to, to elephants out of it, and they're considering it. I met with the Tanzanian tourism minister when I was over there this spring, and uh, he, he gave us a little tour of the, the ivory stockpile here. Um, it's kind of sad to, to see. But the reason they're not good, they don't get rid of this ivory is because it's like money in the bank. It's like gold in the bank, because it's still worth a, quite a bit of money. Okay, we're winding down here. This is, a, this is a, just a quick shot of ivory, and hippo teeth are also a big traded item. You can see that this, this tusk is four kilos, which is about eight pounds, a little bit more than eight pounds. And I, I show you this because uh, 100 years ago, tusks weighing 180 pounds were not, un, not unusual, like taller than me. Nowadays, tusks weighing eight pounds are what they trade, and those are from young, young, uh, young elephants. Sadly, here's the result of a poached elephant. This is what happens to an elephant when they take the ivory. This is in Uganda, in a field in Uganda. But there is hope. Um, rhinos are making a comeback in some parts of Africa. This is at a conservancy in Uganda where rhinos were extinct in the 80s from Idi Amin's soldiers uh, driving around shooting wildlife, getting drunk and shooting wildlife. There's a conservancy in Uganda called Ziwa Rhino Conservancy. They started with six and now they have 24. Uh, Brendan and I were lucky one day to see all 24. This is a one month old baby. Um, so there are organizations working very hard to bring these animals back, but each one of these rhinos has an armed guard 24 hours a day, every single one of them. So it's a very expensive proposition. There are other countries in Africa doing good uh, conservation work. Botswana is doing well. Uh, and there are other countries in Africa that are really pushing hard for conservation. So again, people in Africa, this is a young a girl from the Ngorogoro Maasai tribe. Uh, the population in Africa currently is 1.3 billion, but it's projected to double in the next 30 years. So uh, a lot of minds need to get together to figure out where all the food comes from, the water comes from, the land comes from. Uh, so it's a, it's, there's the challenges ahead for sure. But this, is a, this was a, a beautiful uh, village I visited in the Ngorogoro conservation area. Lions again. Uh, what's, the, what's the history or what's the future for lions? This is the same lion I photographed earlier you saw. This is after she got sick of me and just showed me the back of her head. Uh, and elephants. This elephant is in the Nile River in Murchison Park in Uganda. The ivory trade is coming down. Uh, Wild Aid recently got Sotheby's uh, and another big auction house to no longer sell animal products like rhino horn, things like that. So little incremental steps. But uh, that's what we have to do, just keep the pressure on. Uh, and these are some elephants in Terengiri National Park in Tanzania. It's a great place to see elephants if, you've ever, if you ever go there and you want to see, just see elephants, Terengiri National Park. So that's it. That's me. Um, here's my website. Here's Wild Aid's website. Um, you can write me an email if you have any questions. I strongly encourage you to you know, find a way to get involved. Uh, visit Wild Aid's website. Visit some of the other organizations I talked about. Uh, the next time you go back to Africa, find a way to do you know, eco-friendly safaris or safaris that give back to the community, things like that. 
Um, and I'm happy to take any questions if there's any questions. I know we're just about out of time. Thank you. In, in terms of conservation efforts, which, which African country would you say is, is leading in the efforts? Like the government actually doing um, that's a good a, job? Or <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not that well versed on the politics of all the, I know that each country has its own unique challenges. Um, some countries are doing better than others. For instance, Tanzania really recognizes the value of tourism, as does Kenya. Uh, Uganda is coming up. They, they see it, they, but it's, it's very difficult to, to get that sort of infrastructure in place, the hotels, the airports, the, all that sort of stuff. A lot of countries see that tourism is a future and their wildlife is important, but the problem is they need help sort of generating that foundation where tourists will come because you need the hotels, you need the airports, you need all that sort of stuff. So there are a lot of countries sort of moving that direction. Um, and and I, when you travel through Africa, I mean, it's obvious when you visit a, a country like Cameroon, which basically has next to zero tourist infrastructure, and then you go to a country like Kenya, where you can stay in beautiful hotels and restaurants. And so it's a, it's a, it's a varied picture across the continent. Some countries do better than others, and, but it's just a matter of trying to pull everybody along. And unfortunately, corruption is a big part of it. And so it's, yeah, it's a challenge for sure. I was wondering, uh, do you have any recommendations for finding some of these uh, eco-friendly safaris or how to... You know, I, I can't give you a name of any specific safari, but if you're, if you're interested in traveling to Africa, there are some companies that do better than others. There are some companies that give a certain percentage of profits back into the local community. There are companies... There are lodge companies, for instance, in Tanzania that only hire local people to work at the lodges. There are, so I would, I would just do a little research when you travel and make sure you're going with a company that gives something back, that involves a community that provides, you know, they're not bringing in their workers from somewhere else. They're employing local people and, and all that kind of stuff. Thank you very much for attending and appreciate it. <laughs>